also falls in love. Welcome to episode 34 of Open the Voice Gate. We are proud members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate, and please rate and subscribe to us on the podcast app of your choosing. On this episode, we're going to do something a little different. I've talked about it before, but this is one of the uh, more interlude style episodes of Open the Voice Gate. And Right, and what we have going on th- this episode is we're going to be first talking about the history of Dragon System and their foreign incursions. My plan is basically to talk about everything excluding Shingo's run and Ring of Honor because we'll be getting into that a lot more on the next episode and Dragon Gate USA. Just because if I spent time talking about Dragon Gate USA, it would probably make this a two and a half to three hour episode and to be honest hearing one person talk about why dragon gate usa failed for that long is bad audio so i'm not going to do that to you but i hope to get into talking about dragon system dating back to torimon japan t2p and torimon x days and how they treated going outside of japan differently between these two different eras of the promotion and how it looks like now And the main reason I want to do this is because last weekend was the Battle of Los Angeles. And because of the Battle of Los Angeles had all these members of both Strong Hearts and Shingo Takagi, it feels like it's a good time to talk about it. So in order to talk about Battle of Los Angeles, we were going to have a special guest coming up later, Drew Spears, who was at the Battle of Los Angeles. And he's going to give his thoughts at seeing some of these Dragon Gate guys and, and Strongheart guys for the first time, and some thoughts on how the overall weekend felt from a Dragon System perspective. And then after that, I'm going to give a live reaction of my thoughts on the big event on September 24th, Dangerous Gate, as that happened as I'm recording the day before. And to end the show, I'll preview the two big televised shows on the Dragon Gate Network coming up at the beginning of October. There's both a Corkin on the second and the final match of Shingo Takagi as a Dragon Gate contracted wrestler on October 7th at Hakata Star Lanes. And without any other delay, let's get into talking about Dragon System and foreign incursions. So when we look back to and think and talk about Dragon System and its work internationally, you really have to start with Ultimo Dragon and his history. After he left New Japan for the first time, he found himself in UWA based out of Nakapon. And this was this was where the roots of Dragon System and Torimon Gym really started because it was based because Torimon Japan and the students all were based around Nakapon as they were training and they found themselves in sort of a relationship with the other promotion that was based out of Arena Nakapon and Grupa International Revolution or IWRG which is a lot easier to say and this has been a relationship that dates throughout the history of the Torimon Jimin in Mexico with the first three classes of Dragon Gate, uh, of people that would become members of Dragon Gate or the Dragon System successors in Torimon Japan, T2P, and Torimon X. So we're talking about people from Shima, Dragon Kid, uh, Tokyo Magnum, Susumu Yokosuka, all the way through to Milano Collection, Ryo Saito, Masato Yoshino, Naruki Doi, and then the uh, the Torimon X class with Kagatora and uh, Naoki Tanizaki. They all did time training in in, in Alcapon and worked IWRG. And if you went through their histories, you'd see that for people like Shima and Dragon Kid, they would start working in Mexico late '97 and a couple matches into 1998 under. 
Uh, Dragon Kid was under the Little Dragon character pretty much up until Torimon Japan launched, and then Shima was Shima Nobunaga through that and through WCW, which is something that a lot of people who go back and watch Nitro Thunder, WCW Saturday Night at the time, might be kind of taken aback to see people like Shima and Dragon Kid show up on the shows, but it was it, it was a relationship forged through Ultimo getting his students some American work. Of course, um, Magnum Tokyo and WCW known as Tokyo Magnum was the one that was featured the most in The Dancing Fools, but Shima would, appeared on a Nitro where he got beat up by uh, Ernest the Cat. There was a couple appearances by Dragon Kid and Suwa and Fuji both had appearances on Saturday night and the WCW Pro uh, television show that w- was put on that that I think was like syndicated throughout on random stations. It wasn't. It was even lower than WCW Saturday Night during that time period. But w- while Ultimo was around and before he really got hurt in 1998, you would see them show up a little bit. And this was for Torimon Japan and uh, good, like the first. Uh, term as it's called because and when we're talking about dragon system wrestlers uh, from the Torimon japan t2p and Torimon x time you have the individual classes which are the Torimon japan t2p tx but you also would have the terms and that basically is a further delineation between people and the classes so you would have the original first termers which were tokyo magnum dragon kid shima Suwa and Don Fuji, but you would have the second termers, which were Susumu Yokosuka and Yuzushi Kanda, for example. And this was how it pretty much existed for the Torimon Japan days. You would go to Mexico and you'd spend upwards of 18 to 24 months there. Some of them were even longer. And you'd do most of your training there and you'd be wrestling in IWRG and making a couple random appearances elsewhere, like one of the first uh, matches of any Torimon Japan students on tape was a match from Arena Mexico that was a six-man match with basically everyone from the first term that just, I, I think it was Rob Viper who found it and put it up on the internet a couple of years ago. But they would appear in CMLL occasionally. There was one or once or twice they would be in AAA, but really not that much. It was all based around IWRG and... Even for the early episodes of Vamanos Amigos, which was the uh, monthly television program for Torimon back in the Torimon days, occasionally about once or twice a year there would be an episode which would be featuring the uh, the Yamaha Cup, which was a tag team tournament that took place in Mexico where the winners got Yamaha scooters, which I believe the first one was won by Susumu Mochizuki, who we know today as Susumu Yokosuka and Yuzushi Kanda. But they would tape these and they put it on Vamanos Amigos. You would see it, it would be some of the earlier matches of these wrestlers' career and it, it would be a way that they would try to start to introduce the new classes of students to the Japanese audience before they made their Mexico debut. Oh, pardon me, their Japanese debut. So it, this is how it existed up until 2004 with the Ultimo Dragon split and when Ultimo and Dragon Gate split and they completely just removed ties with Ultimo, they kind of went inwards for a while. And this was kind of considered like a closed door period for Dragon Gate, where it was for the first two or three years up until 2006, there was not a lot of foreign, uh, foreign travel from them. They were focusing on building up Dragon Gate and focused on building up the promotion in Japan because it was such a huge thing for them to leave Ultimo. And this is where you had the everyday everyday wrestling in Odaiba where they did a bunch of of programs for Fuji TV. And it was really trying to rebuild the brand and and get a new fan influx that might have left when they when the fans saw all this drama that went on with uh, the split with Ultimo. Although the Ring of Honor and Dragon Gate relationship really is known for starting at the 2006 WrestleMania weekend in Chicago. The actual groundwork for it was started to be led 
or sorry to be laid down during the Dragon Gate Invasion show in 2005 in Buffalo, New York, where both Shima and Shingo Takagi came over and wrestled in matches. But the the big thing about Ring of Honor and Dragon Gate, at least from a Dragon Gate perspective, was this was the home for Shingo Takagi during his excursion in late 2006 through 2007. And uh, it, it's interesting how this was more of a traditional excursion that you might see out of New Japan, All Japan, and NOAA, but it was the first time there really was one like this in Dragon Gate. And with Ring of Honor and FIP being the nominal home for Shingo Takagi, this kind of continued upon the Western exposure influx that happened at the 2006 WrestleMania with the uh, now legendary six-man tag that got five stars in the Observer. And it's interesting that he really got his name known through Ring of Honor and FIP, but Shingo was actually based in San Antonio during this time. Dragon Gate, they put together a very small satellite office in San Antonio, Texas, where he was based out of, and Shingo did some wrestling in Texas during this time, most notably for the Anarchy Championship Wrestling promotion in Austin, but it really was the the ROH relationship that allowed him to prosper, along with, at the time, this was also when this was also when Dragon Gate started its relationship with PWG that continues to this day. And it was interesting to me that Shingo got this long excursion, whereas you didn't really see very many excursions happening for his uh, contemporaries because BB Hulk came over and really only did a couple of weekends in, in Ring of Honor for his time at, as that I guess we count his excursion, but really was more just like a, just him traveling. Yamato had a little bit more as a winner of the first ever DG Next tournament, the next one. He became a, uh, he was allowed to go on excursion, and it was it was only a couple of weekends there, and it wasn't so much of a full excursion, more of just him getting a chance to travel to FIP and Ring of Honor and perform in front of a more wide audience. And, this was it for a while for excursions for Dragon Gate wrestlers. It, but because of how slowly they rolled out the the initial graduates of the DG JoJo, it just wasn't. They, they weren't just. They didn't constantly have someone going out on an excursion, out on an excursion. And of course, Takashi Yoshida was actually found by Dragon Gate in the United States. He was at the time a student of the Anoki Dojo in Los Angeles, and. He was considered much too short at the time to be in New Japan, but Ring of Honor, but through Ring of Honor and FIP, more so FIP, the uh, Dragon Gate office became aware of Takashi Yoshida, and they hired him and brought him in from there. So that's kind of an interesting wrinkle in, uh, in the uh, Dragon Gate in the United States story, because a lot of people nowadays who came on lately might not realize the back history of Takashi Yoshida. I mean, he was an arm wrestler who went to the States because he couldn't train in the uh, DG Jojo in Japan, got to wrestle in the Noki Dojo, and actually spent some time on the uh, LA indie scene for a while before he adopted the Cyber Kong character and really got a lot more work in Florida. And then for Dragon Gate, worst fit that's been a relationship that really started in 2006 and it has gone had its ebbs and flows more so and the ebbs and flows more so because of the scheduling of dragon gate dragon gate had at the time was looking at wrestling 200 to 250 shows a year so there wasn't a lot of time off for the guys to go internationally so it would be Bola weekends, the uh, former DDT4 weekends that you would see Dragon Gate guys over in PWG, and most notably how Shima won the 2007 Battle of Los Angeles. And really, the relationship between uh, Ring of Honor and Dragon Gate led up, went all the way through 2008 until there was a pretty big falling out. There was claims that Ring of Honor thought that DG didn't pay for its share of the uh, of the shows that uh, Ring of Honor did in Japan in 2008, and this also happened around the time that Gabe Sapolsky was fired as Booker of Ring of Honor. And 
but because of these events, DG pulled back from doing shows and sending their talent over to Ring of Honor. And at that time, that's when they started forming, a, a, that's how they started forming Dragon Gate USA. And as I said earlier, that's a topic that deserves its own kind of segment to talk about it. So I'm going to gloss over that. An interesting thing about this time period and particularly the relationship of Dragon Gate with PWG was this random show that they that ran in 2008 in Bell Gardens, California, which is an LA suburb, and it was called the Dragon Gate Friday LA Extreme Night Show, and it's kind of interesting because this was a show that they put on way before uh way before DG USA. I mean, this was a good a, a good half year before it, it happened on September no, uh, September 5th, 2008. And I'm just going to read down the card just because it it in retrospect is a really wild card. The opener was a match between Lil Cholo, Infernal, and Junior. And then they got into... The rest of the matches had a lot more Dragon Gate guys on it, as the first one was uh, El Generico defeating Ginky Horiguchi. And a lot of people might not know this, but El Generico's first big Japanese experience was not through DDT. He was a Dragon Gate guy, and he was linked to the Tazawa Juku stable and then later did some stuff with New Hazard. But it... His first like real exposure out there was through the Russell Jam project, which was the other side of the coin when Dragon Gate started sending people over to the United States. They started bringing in talent from both Mexico and uh, Mexico and America, and you had some some talent that would stick around, like like El, Ger- El Generico, Pac. You had uh, Jack Evans, of course, was the first really big Gaijin star that they they kind of started to develop but and you also had some mexican wrestlers come through as well but you also had some really weird uh, gaijin show up and drank it at that time eric cannon was a member of muscle outlaws the uh, that existed at the time during wrestle jam was they brought over chris bosch from 2000 from the early to mid 2000s pwg and it just if you watch like some of these wrestle jam shows it's kind of wild because he's just trying to talk to the crowd and trying to do his shtick that doesn't fly in 2018 and really didn't fly in 2006 in Japan. And notably, this was also the time period that they brought over Austin Aries and uh, and Roderick Strong and how there was this big hullabaloo at the time because it seemed that Roderick Strong really seriously injured Naruki Doi, but it just was a situation that kind of happened Naruki Doi was already kind of banged up and there was a match that kind of was the last thing that made him go on the shelf for a while but getting back to this Dragon Gate Friday LA Extreme Night card you had Necro Butcher versus Stalker Ichikawa and this was during the time of the uh, Hollywood Stalker Ichikawa Buso 10 match series where basically up until like Stalker got phased back and not really being on shows except for bigger ones and 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 in comedy appearances, Stalker would have these series where he faced a lot of people. He like famously f- fought uh, Aja Kong, he fought Akira Hokuto, and he would basically get the crap beat out of him. But it was the idea of trying to do the typical rookie trial series, but for Stalker, where he would basically lose everything. But he had, but he had a series of two matches against Necro Butcher, and it's interesting because this is around the time that he adopted the Hollywood nickname. Because he went to the States a little bit before this, but really after this LA Extreme Friday night, this was the br- this is what really brought him up there. The uh, continuing down the card, there was Dragon Kid and Kendo versus the Taku the, the Zawajuku team of uh, Taku Wasa and, and Kenichiro Arai, which is really wild because this was a time period that Araiwa was one of the better tag teams in the world, and to my knowledge, this was the only time that Taku Wasa wrestled in the united states and wrestled in north america since he came through in t2p so that's just kind of a weird thing to see and the shingo takagi defeated Pac during this card and that's a show that or that's a match that we might be seeing in the future especially if shingo takagi leaving dragon gate so that's kind of a fun one the semi-main event was an open the twin gate title match between the ryosuka team of ryo saito and susumu yokosuka defeating the young bucks Matt and Nick Jackson, and again, a lot like uh, El Generico uh, started his his Japan career in Dragon Gate. So did the Bucks. The Bucks were 
they were around a bunch in 2007 through 2009, basically right up until they signed that deal with TNA. And it's kind of interesting because of how big, how big of a star they became of New Japan, but they were just these kids that were world one assistants. They weren't even like full members. They were just Gaijin that came on the tours and basically watched all the matches from the from ringside and I think you could really draw how the how the young bucks evolved as wrestlers and how it really started with his time in Dragon Gate. The main event of the uh, the Dragon Gate Friday LA Extreme Night show was a open the Triangle Gate title match and this really tells you what time period this was in Dragon Gate history where the champion real hazard team of Gamma, Yamato and Yuzushi Kanda defeated the World One team of BB Hulk, Masato Yoshino, and Naruki Doi. And another kind of wild sign of the times of, of the card was that the, the commentary was provided by the PWG regulars of Disco Machine and Excalibur. So that's that was a wild that, that's kind of a wild thing and an interesting note, at least in my opinion, because you you always hear about DG USA and the Ring of Honor shows, but people have seemingly forgot about this one random LA show that happened. And this was pre the this time period of 2008-2009 led into DG, DG USA as I mentioned, but there really weren't many excursions then until Tozawa was sent on excursion. Tozawa's excursion began in 2010 after he lost a loser's banish to the dark matches match between his former Kamikaze teammate Cyber Kong at Dead or Alive 2010, and. Tozawa's excursion was a bit different than Shingo Takagi's, but it's very interesting because when he left Dragon Gate, he was the bottom of the bottom. Sure, he led Tozawa Juku, but that was a joke stable, and it really was more of a punishment than it was an honor. And then after Tozawa Juku failed, he kind of, he just receded, and he kind of, he was always the bottom man in Kamikaze, he was more often than not left off shows and until he really started the feud with Cyber Kong and was sent away. And in a lot of ways, this excursion was a put up or shut up moment for Akira Tozawa. The, the company, again, was very low on him and it was trying to see, okay, can we get anything out of this guy? Which is kind of insane in retrospect because he always had all the talent in the world. He just was either incredibly immature or not motivated properly. And this excursion really gave him the motivation he needed. He was based out of Huntington Beach. And interestingly enough, he more often than not was was stayed with the former Gaijin appearance of former guy who, Gaijin who made an appearance in Dragon Gate, King Alibaba. And that kind of started a friendship that existed to this day. So he did spend a lot of time in DG USA, but PWG was his true home of this excursion and kind of made Tozawa into the wrestler he would become later on and today, especially starting with his feud of matches with uh, Kevin Steen. They kind of formed this like hated, like, like frenemies team that was really something special and it was that they had a crazy brawling match at one PWG show during the holidays where they started picking up boxes that were next to a Christmas tree at the American Legion Hall and started attacking each other with them. And it really gave Tozawa weirdly through this match and through the the bola he participated in. He it gave him the confidence he needed to really show his charisma and his unique wrestling style. But if we're going to talk about Tozawa and PWG, we have to talk about his series of matches against Chris Hero because if any wrestler left a mark on Akira Tozawa throughout his career, it's Chris Hero. And there were a series of three matches that started with the 2010 Battle of Los Angeles on September 5th. And it was the second round match against Chris Hero that he really started to become known and really improved his station throughout the wrestling world. And that continued to 2011 during the DDT4 tournament where him and Kevin Steen teamed up as the Nightmare Violence Collection. And they got a upset victory against the Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions at that time, the Kings of Wrestling of 
Claudio Castagnoli slash uh, Cesaro and Chris Hero and they made it to the finals of that tournament where they lost to the Young Bucks but it was a really big moment for Akira Tozawa at this tournament and it, it the uh, the Chris Hero feud kind of would continue they would have their final match on his last show in the states uh, on uh, All Star Weekend eight where they where he wrestled. He wrestled three week, three good matches during this week, and the first one was the Nightmare Violence Collection team defeating El Generica and Ricochet, which is kind of an interesting match in retrospect, knowing how close of friends Akira Tozawa and Ricochet be, have become nowadays that they had this match here. And then the next night, they fa- they faced and defeated the Rock to the Nest Mar- Monsters, who were, at the time, were a hot act in PWG. They where a local LA act that eventually got phased up as PWG started bringing in more and more international stars. And interestingly enough, after this match, Chris Hero came out, noting that this was Akira Tozawa's last performance in PWG before he would go back to Japan. And they he challenged him for one more match, in which, in, in which Hero and, and Tozawa had another barn burner. All, all these PWG matches, since they're so far back are available on the high spots network and they're really worth seeking out especially because for as much as people mention that that shima does not have the great singles matches Sazawa does and especially during his pwg period if you're going to pick matches to watch from it definitely watch the watch his first match against chris hero watch the holidays brawl i talked about with kevin steen watch the nightmare violence collection versus connection versus king of versus the kings of wrestling there's a later trios match where it was the or i forget who was the new unit world one the nightmare violence collection connection and site and super dragon who i think their team was appetite for the, the chris the the uh the super dragon and kevin steen team was called appetite for destruction and the and i think like the goodbye name was the appetite for nightmare violence or something like that it it was on one of the kurt russell mania shows so that's worth watching as well and then of course watch this final match with chris hero and it was through this time that that tozawa really made a name for himself he made appearances in chikara for king of trios he did some appearances in acw the awesome promotion that shingo also was and and if anyone had a uh, if you're ranking like all-time excursions throughout like the wrestling world starting from about 2000 on akira tozawa has to be one of the most successful ones from the matches they were putting on to who he became afterwards of course kazuchiko caught and ate a very disappointing excursion and came back as the best wrestler in the world but akira tozawa was put on a stage to let him show how good of a wrestler he was and as soon as he came back into dragon gate that was when they finally had the confidence in him and just gave him the rockets. And I mean, in a period of a year, he went from being the number two guy in Blood Warriors to disbanding Junction 3 to leading and creating Mad Blanky. And ever since then, he kind of was a made man. I mean, in 2012, he headlined Kobe World. Lastly, I want to talk about the Dragon Gate excursions to Mexico. There were four of them. And... I didn't talk about KZ earlier, which, because his his excursion happened between Shingo Takagi's and Akira Tozawa's. But the issue with KZ's excursion is it's hard for me. It was hard for me to research and find proof of matches other than his match in Chikara. So KZ won the uh, next one tournament, and in doing so, he was able to go on excursion to Mexico, and it was there that. The relationship with IWRG and specifically Skyda reformed, and Skyda would do some tours in Dragon Gate. He was known more in Dragon System history as a primary trainer of the Dragon System guys, especially in the Tormon days. Ultimo, real he did do training, but it's more noted that it was the luchadors like Dos Caras and Skyda who did. The majority of his training so sky so sky was training kz through 2008 and then into 2009 he was he was based in a iwrg but it's i went to lucha wiki i went through cards 
it's hard to find out if he actually even wrestled. He might have just been tra been training with him in Nakapong. But KZ did do an appearance at King of Trios as the MC's KZ character before he returned back to Japan to join the the more prominent excursion to Mexico happened in 2012 and 2013 involving the Millennials. The first one to go was Ada, as during this time in 2012, Dragon Gate was obsessed with each other, with wrestlers chopping each other, and they started a King of Chop tournament to see who had the hardest and most painful chop in the company. And it was kind of a ridiculous thing where they would put the ring bell in the middle of the ring. Everyone would do either three or five chops to each other and if and if someone submitted by ringing the bell they lost or went to a fan decision but ada who was a rookie at this time was completely destroying everyone in chops like to the extent that there were some guys who would take one chop immediately ring the bell and leave because how painful his chops were so Ada won the 2012 King of Chop, and the winner of King of Chop was supposed to be able to name a wish or desire for them. And was that he wanted to team with Shima, and then he wanted to go to Mexico. So he would team with Shima, and then later he would go to Mexico to train. And this is sort of when Dragon Gate's relationship with IWRG and DT and DTU kind of formed and changed a little bit as when Ada was in Mexico, he was primarily based out of Nakapon, but he, through his training and his travels, he got to know the DTU guys very well, in particular Flamita. So this is how Flamita got introduced into Dragon Gate was during Ada and the rest of the Millennials excursion. And Ada showed up on a, he did a couple of Paris Del Mal show. He had a Peros de Mall t-shirt. I don't know if he was ever a former member of the group, but he definitely was someone who did a lot with them. And he was the only one down there for a while until Tomahawk T he T T, now better known as T Hawk, went down to Mexico. And the way that this happened was this was a part of the the overall uh Naoki Tanazaki and Pastor Naoki storyline where at the final match there was a Loser gets gets kicked out of their unit, and Imposter Naoki, Tegmahawk TT, lost the match, and Mad Blanky completely turned on him, and he did a short about month where he was unaffiliated before he went down to Mexico, joining up with Ada at in Nalcopon with, uh, with IWRG and DTU, and he started wrestling as Tomahawk, and... During this time, this was also during DG USA, so there were some appearances by Ada and Tomahawk up in America, but not as many as like, Tozawa did so much in DG USA, but not as much here. The last millennial to go do, an, do a significant excursion was uh, Utah, and the the story about Utah, who later became UT, is really interesting because. Right before his formal debut, like when he was going to become a, uh, when he was going to debut on the roster, he left in the middle of the night and went to Mexico. And the storyline was that that Tomahawk and Ada, uh, who were classmates and and partners with him at the time of their training, called him and said, "No, no, no, don't go to, to don't don't debut, don't go to the show. Come with us in Mexico and train." So. That was when, that's how UT went down there. So for a lot of early 2013, you had this trio around the Mexican Indies doing a lot of doing a lot of shows. Again, mainly IWRG and DTU. Both Ada and Tomahawk won the Alto Impacto title for DTU, and they they had this excursion up until after Kobe World 2013, where they started announcing the return of the Millennials and the formation of the Millennials happened in August of 2013, which is kind of interesting to me because how this unit really formed in Mexico and they brought they brought Flamita immediately over. Later, Yosuke San Maria would appear with them and join the unit. And they also had another luchador by the name of Rocky Lobo who did about two tours of Dragon Gate, disappeared, ended up doing a couple tours of pro wrestling Noah of all places, and now is virtually retired. Well, that does it for this kind of brief rundown of excursions and 
farm dragon system people in the Americas and and I thought this was kind of important to talk about because right now we're going to get to an interview with my brother Drew Spears who was live at Bola as the first big card of OWE Stronghearts meeting up with a at the time Dragon Gate affiliated wrestler. Joining me for this week's episode actually is my brother. It's Drew Spears. Drew's been going to PWG shows since pretty much since you moved out to LA, right? Yeah, I uh hey Mike. Um hey, Drew. I started hey, going, you know, periodically from 2011 2013 and then pretty much regularly uh since 2014. Yeah. So you've kind of been able to see the whole entire PWG boom, for lack of better words. Yeah, I mean, it was always selling out, like, within a day since I've been going. So, but, like, certainly around 2015 uh, on, it definitely felt like it had a different energy uh, and a certain fanaticism around it, you know, along with the rise of, you know, the box and bullet club and stuff like that uh this was uh you know also the first uh set of shows i've seen in gl- the globe i haven't been able to get out much to pwg this year largely because uh some scheduling stuff i also uh kind of invested my time in going to the uh, new japan shows uh this year so uh that was kind of my first priority so to see them in uh the globe for the first time was pretty cool so i was lucky i think was it 2015 to come out with you for bola yeah it was the uh zach saber jr uh winning uh as well as the uh peak of uh Mount Rushmore 2.0 stuff uh which i think uh you know if I had, I've been thinking about this, which Bola that I liked better, but it's definitely in between either 2015 or this year's for me. Uh, this year was definitely, uh, maybe due to the Globe Theater, uh, definitely much uh, better paced than any other uh, Bola that I had been to. Uh, you know, I think uh, PWG has a bit of reputation of, you know, especially at Reseda, starting late, you know, getting people in the door, uh, and then those uh, night three shows being particularly brutal, but this year uh, night three came in at like I think four hours uh, fifteen, four hours twenty minutes, uh, and not to mention uh, it's now two weeks later in the year because of all in presumably. Uh, so the weather was a lot more amendable this year versus you know baking in the Reseda sun for you know, 90 minutes before you even get inside of uh, American Legion, uh, which, you know, American Legion is a very cool and special building and, like, you know, there's things that you don't get at Globe, but uh, I think it's still a uh, net positive, uh, the new venue. Right. I mean, as much as I enjoyed night one and night two of Bola 2015, I think like one of my last memories was just how painfully long and hot night three was. So hearing that they've kind of learned how to negotiate that better with the Globe Theater and then having it later in the year yeah. must be a, a big help. At least I remember someone like, passed out in the line in 2015. Yes. Uh, I mean, they're also... Uh you know, uh, opening doors, you know, 90 minutes before the show now. So you can like, if you get there early enough and you really want to get a good seat, you're not going to be, I mean, unless you're a fanatic who wants to like, wait, like for two hours to get your perfect spot, you know, chances are you're going to just be waiting to like get inside the doors pretty quickly. Uh, so (laughs) comfort wise, uh, you can definitely say that people are enjoying it uh, a lot more at, uh, the Globe, uh, you know, I think there's some drawbacks. The drinks are m- much more expensive at the Globe Theater, uh, which, uh, you know, makes sense. But they also now have, like, uh, three bars or something like that, uh, as well as an outdoor smoking section uh, in the Globe. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that I was surprised with, you, you don't get this on the video, um, well, certainly it's like an old-style theater, Um I think at least if you're sitting on the uh, ground floor, you still have a little bit of that immediacy that you get in Reseda. Uh, There's definitely a little bit more rows uh, in the globe, 
but I still felt like, oh, this is on top of the action. I'm not like, uh, you know, kind of at a distance from anything, um, which is impressive considering that it's a very large venue. I felt like I had uh, line of sights pretty good. How many people would you say were there? You know, I th- I haven't had an firm number of exactly what the globe holds. Uh, so uh, I I think I've heard that it holds seven hundred for uh, PWG, uh, and I think that through the three nights, I would say that it probably had like six fifty. You know, I I definitely saw some like seats not being full. Uh, I definitely saw on Twitter, you know, people still looking to sell their tickets, uh, you know, night of. So I would say, you know, 650 on any given night, maybe a little bit more packed on night three. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it was about 450, if I remember right, for Reseda. So mm-hmm. it's, even though people are talking about it doubling seat wise, the fact that it's 650 with those prices, they're still probably turning out pretty well for each show. So yeah, they're they're definitely uh, doing good, and uh, they also mentioned that they now get a cut of the bar, which you know, uh, though more expensive, you know, people were definitely uh, drinking a fair amount. So uh, I think they're doing good. Leech and Larry would never do that. No, Leech, never. And Larry, Leech and Larry, who I still have a beef with because he took my pack of gum before one night. Like they have to be happy that that they're dealing with someone who's not like a. a 80 year old madman well, what's what's wild is okay so Reseda. one of the reasons why it takes so long to get in is that uh they would do you know real arduous you know check of bags and you know check your pockets and stuff like that which you know you get a lot in la and i think you get a lot at pretty much any live shows is you know security and stuff like that mm-hmm. uh and i was expecting that if not more so at the globe but, but truth be told like I mean, granted, I didn't have, like, a backpack or anything with me, but, like, they weren't, like, you know, turn out your pockets. Let's make sure you don't have anything inside. Uh, So, yeah, uh, they were definitely less uh, harsh on security, uh, shall we say, uh, at the Globe. But, yeah, I mean, that that was the only show that I've had that that had, like, anywhere close to an arduous screening process was at PWG, like, at New Orleans over Mania Weekend, it was just like, oh, hey, can we just make sure you don't have food or water coming in? And every, it's like, oh, you have a backpack? We got to check your backpack. But no, Leech and Larry, like, take off your hat, spin around, full pats down. It was kind of ridiculous. But given what kind of venue that it was, I was not surprised that, like, a full, that a bunch of troops would be super serious about their security and people bringing things in. Definitely, Yeah. yeah. So let's get into the shows themselves. This was kind of an interesting weekend as this was really, with the exception of Tozawa, the first uh, Dragon Gate, Dragon System, OWE appearances for a lot of, for like Shingo and Shima for a good six years. And it was kind of, kind of funny. You were talking about the PWG boom and even, and Dragon Gate for a lot of reasons missed out on appearing with the, at during this boom if it was because of scheduling if it was because it's just expensive to fly people out from japan and suddenly it's it at least from someone who did not go to the shows and was like following online it kind of felt like how 2015 was the rise of like the european wrestler like 2018 really was a dragon system year with with uh seven people in the all over the weekend between shima shingo takagi Wentz and Xavier, Fulmita, Bendito, and T Hawk all making appearances. Did you feel like this was kind of the like the theme of the weekend? Kind of was like a Dragon System theme, or did it feel more like I don't know the weekend of Bandito? I mean, uh, Bandito uh, specifically, you know, definitely had you know the crowd behind them and like you know most of the love. Uh, but I mean, certainly people were super into seeing Shingo. People were certainly uh, into uh, strong hearts at large, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, whether it be because of the recent influx of indie people into WWE, or you know, Flamita and Bandito and Xavier and Wentz doing so good in PWD that they're like, you know, let's bring in uh, the rest of that crew. I'm not positive, but yeah, people were definitely. Uh, as into the Dragon Gate guys uh, as anyone else on the card, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, 
Ilya had it, you know, quite a, uh, a lot of heat uh, throughout the weekend, and people were definitely very excited to see him. Uh, PCO, of co- of course, uh, you know, I mean, people were pretty much hot to see anyone new, but uh, I think especially uh, Chingo uh, was probably the one that I think most people were like, if they weren't you know, a fan at the beginning of the weekend, by the end, you know, by, by the end of the, his first match, you know, people were definitely, you know, as into him as anyone else in the tournament. Yeah, and it seems like with all the recent news with Shingo, especially with this being his really kind of the, his first independent date, knowing that in less than two, three weeks, really, three weeks, he's going to be out of Dragon Gate. This was kind of like him putting himself out there in the same way that PCO did at Joey Janela Spring Break. That I I've heard already that he's that they're trying to bring him back already for October show. Yeah, I think and, I saw that on his uh, Twitter feed. Uh, I'll be curious to see if that uh, happens. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it's smart timing to get in uh, Bola if you're him. You know, I think. Uh, you know, if you're international or if you're a lucha, I think you look at like how quickly someone like Bandito's uh, profile could be. You know, you know he debuted in uh, what did we have this on here? Uh, March of uh, this year, and now you know he's doing great across the country, if not internationally. So I think everyone kind of sees that. You know. You get in with PWG as a national profile, and then everything else kind of takes off from there. You know, it's me curious to see what like people like Shingo or uh, we haven't mentioned him yet, and he's not a Dragon System guy, but you know, Puma King uh, was uh, so insanely over uh, throughout the weekend that you know, pretty much after his match uh, over the intermission, people were flooding him for merch and he sold out of stuff so quickly and had a line all weekend uh that it's very uh cool to see someone get made on that level so quickly and so immediately yeah and i'm looking at his cage match right now because i was trying to figure out what he was doing on night two since he was not there and apparently and i don't know if this is right or not he went from the from Bola to Mexico City for an impact taping and back to Bola during that weekend. So he really had, I, I would say outside of Shingo, at least it seems to me that he kind of was one of the other people who had the major breakout weekend. Yeah, definitely. Uh, people, uh, you know, just uh, a mix of like a, a gimmick that people love and also just being a very proficient worker. Um yeah, I think you're going to see him a lot more uh, in America. And uh, I mean, you know, I think uh, I, this is not a Lucha podcast, so I don't want to get on too much of a tangent. But I think everyone has seen that you can either, you know, work with CMLL or AAA and kind of like have to play by their rules, or you can do a year or two uh, independently and do the Pentagon and Phoenix model, and then you can come back as so much more of a commodity and kind of call your own shots. Oh, sure. Yeah. And especially for someone like him that was kind of slotted at a place and in CMLL without going too deep into it. When you're slotted into a place, you're kind of fixed there for the rest of your career unless something changes. He definitely took advantage of a breath of fresh air to kind of break out and do his own thing. It'll put him, like you said, in a lot better position and either next year or in 2020, a lot like how uh, a lot like how Phoenix and Penta did. So talking about Puma King, uh, let's just get into the matches. Yeah. Uh, as they had night one was one of the big was one of the bigger busier night for all the Dragon System guys. Everyone who was over there, with the exception of the Rascals, had a match that night. Uh Flamita had actually had Puma in the first round where he beat him. What were your thoughts of this match live? Uh, it was great. Um, it was, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, Puma King, who, you know, was not known, uh, at a large scale to the audience, uh, much to, uh, some controversy online, uh, certainly, uh, pretty much by the time he was done with his entrance, you know, had a crowd in the palm of his hand, uh, you know, the crowd already loves Flamita, uh, and they uh, worked uh, a really fun match. Uh, you know, you know, Puma King, uh, I think, you know, people 
just were so into him uh, that, you know, if anything, maybe slightly disappointed that he didn't uh, win. But, you know, uh, it was a really fast paced, a lot of topes, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, just a really uh, great uh, kind of intro for Puma King and, you know, Flamita, who, you know, I think uh, maybe has been a little bit in Bandito's shadow the last uh, couple of months, you know, uh, kind of set him up to be like, you know, not necessarily, you know, the first round exit guys. You know, I think uh, it was clear on, you know, by halfway through night one that this was going to be a very lucha centric uh you know bola with you know horus and flamita and bandito all going over and into the second round that you know they were clearly building around these guys so uh yes this first half of uh night one uh even the non uh dragon state gate stuff you know with uh horus and brooks definitely worth seeing uh really i think that uh horace and brooks match was great as well so would you put that as your match of the night at least for tournament matches in night one um boy match of the night tournament night one uh i think it's got to be either uh yeah puma king and flamita or uh brooks and horace yeah, yeah and it's interesting enough that how now looking at they did the tournament. They kind of really set up that all via the three Lucha guys and night one who all advanced ended up facing Shema and Rascals as strong hearts in night two. I thought that's now looking back was kind of smart booking in a way. Yeah, you definitely have uh, that match, which was, you know, a lot of commodities in there. Uh, and, you know, you also weren't burning, you know, the chance to put Shima against, you know, someone like, I guess, Janela or, you know, Bandito uh, against, uh, you know, those out-of-tournament uh, matches. Uh, sometimes it's just like, oh, shit, we want to get these people working together, and sometimes it's setting stuff up for the rest of the tournament, as uh, you'll see with uh, the end of night one tag. Right, yeah, and talking about, like, other things they set up, the next the next uh, Dragon System match was uh, Shima versus Jody Flush. That was a match that... I don't know how many people in the building knew, but like 1999, the two of them had, two of them were in Michinoku Pro at the same time. And it was kind of a very lauded match for Jody Fleisch as a flyer, as a flyer at, at the turn of the turn of the millennium. And then Shima, of course, was like, was maybe just across two years in the business. And they had a rematch almost 20 years later. How would you think? Well, okay, first off, well, I think this was your first time ever seeing Shima live. What was your impression uh, of was he seeing not him live? In, was he not in uh, those Orlando Ring of Honor shows? Oh, uh, he was, right. Was I forgot. Yeah, yeah th that's true. Yeah, so so, so you, you've you seen then, of people on the show, you've seen Shima and Shingo live out of the Dragon Gate guys. You've never seen T-Hawk. That's correct. All right, uh, so. Yeah, but, you know, now we're talking about, you know, 12 or 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh you know uh so this was an interesting match uh and i've been thinking about it a lot over the last week because i think uh it i mean the entrances you know uh i'll, I'll just say it fleisch didn't seem very over with the crowd uh at least up top it seemed like other people didn't know who he was or you know just like it was a newer guy Sh shima seemed uh more over definitely you know people who remembered him or knew that you know he was at that point past winner um of course you know the boom was fairly over um and uh yeah this match you know had highs and lows uh i've been looking at reactions online and i think uh it's run the gamut and i think uh there's parts of the match that i really liked and uh there's stuff that i, I could have done without uh it was the second longest match of tournament night one uh at 16 minutes and uh it started off with a lot of ground-based stuff uh and i think maybe some of that being you know there was two very fast-paced matches right before it with uh, horace and brooks and flamita and puma king uh and then i would say a lot of that 16 minutes was also uh kind of comedy spots mm -hmm. um and it seemed like they just never fully had the audience uh for the first half of the match uh 
the second half was a lot cooler. They brawled uh, into the uh, crowd and specifically kind of to the area that uh, I was in. I, I don't know how good of a vantage point other people had. Uh, you know, they were throwing signs at each other and, you know, doing some real hard hitting shit. Uh, I believe I didn't have a perfect vantage point, but I believe Fleisch did his uh, wall moonsault, uh, which, uh, you know, I think that'll play really well on uh, tape. And then it, it kind of worked into a nice uh, finish back in the ring with uh, some good uh, kind of uh, flying stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would have, you know, comedy stuff for me is very... Uh, hot and cold so I wish that could have been cut down a bit or you know uh, maybe the placement of this match maybe should have been later in the show uh, but yeah it seemed to be kind of a cool down match for the audience uh, though uh, Sima Shima definitely got uh, the crowd on his side uh, especially with uh, you know boom and stuff like that so I mean I'd be curious to see what the reaction is when it makes tape because uh uh, you know, I would say it was hit or miss live. And that's one of the things that I found interesting from Shima, both in singles matches and really this year since he left Dragon Gate. A lot of the stuff he's done outside of Russell 1 has been, I, I think the best way to put it was he's not necessarily going into third or fourth gear in these matches. He's someone that's willing to you know, coast on it. I mean, he turned 40 last year and he's been wrestling since mm-hmm. he was since he was a teenager. So I understand that. And then it, it's also he's never been someone that has had the great singles match. And that's kind of one of the big uh I, I guess stumbling blocks is the best way to say it for people to easily write him in as a Hall of Famer because he just he's great in multi-mans, he's great in tags, but his best singles matches don't nearly come to the high level as someone like Shingo Takagi or other people in Dragon Gate. So hearing all this doesn't really surprise me too much. I haven't seen much of Fleisch since he's returned. I know that he last year was... Oh, sorry. Uh, this is going to go off for a minute. It's our oh, I forgot. Clock. I forgot yeah. y'all had a cuckoo clock, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I'll... Cool, that was quick. <laughs> I totally forgot that y'all had a cuckoo clock, but yeah. Uh, but and I've been, Fleisch has been someone who's kind of been in and out of wrestling for a while. So mm-hmm. hearing that they hearing that they've done in a 16 minute match that two thirds of it was comedy before they did crowd brawling doesn't surprise me that much. So I, I then again with the, the crowd brawling, it just matters. I've not seen a taped PWG show since they moved to the Globe, so I don't know necessarily how their setup is for that. So I, th- yeah. I, think that's, I think that's the other thing about how it comes across on DVD. Yeah, I'll be very uh, curious to see what the reactions of it is once uh, that hits tape. Uh, but yeah, I mean, moving down night one, the uh, next match was Bandito and T-Hawk. Now, T-Hawk's someone that I haven't actually seen live because he was it was before he went on an excursion in Mexico and did some DG USA shows. Uh, and he was someone that... I felt like that this was there was a reason why Shima brought him along versus a Linda man or trying to get a visa for the OWE guys. So as someone who did you see any of the shows with Bandito before before the this bola? Had I seen Bandito live? I believe the answer to that is no. Uh yeah, he debuted uh right after I uh kinda missed uh like, you know, four or five months of PWG stuff. So getting to see him live and uh, already so insanely over, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's definitely, you know, a large portion of the crowd who he was their guy. They wanted him to win uh, the tournament very badly. Um, And, you know, I think also you had a good amount of uh, Lucha scene adjacent people who came in for the... uh, tournament and as well, as well as just you know i think a lot of those people are kind of based close to los angeles so it felt like like almost like a uh home field advantage for bandito throughout the weekend uh probably only he and maybe 
Janela and Cobb kind of got that sort of reaction. Um, but yes, uh, Bandito, incredibly over. Uh, match was great. Uh, first time seeing T Hawk, uh, great heel uh, during this, you know, was chopping the hell out of Bandito. Uh, they were really going hard on the chops. Definitely, uh, I mean, there was some good flying in it, but it was definitely a little bit more grounded than I expected, a little bit more hard hitting. Um, T Hawk, I think, has a great look. Uh, he definitely uh, is willing to lean in uh, to heal stuff. You know, he was chopping Bandito and the crowd was booing and he was stopping to do a, you know, titty dance uh, for the crowd. Uh, you know, uh, so I think it was definitely like the first uh, round uh, perfect kind of heal for Bandito where you want to kind of get him to get his underdog shine in. So have, I mean, have they worked a lot together, Mike? Well, Bandito, when he was in... Uh, he's coming back to Dragon Gate now, but he only did a couple of tours before the the split. And he had, as I'm looking at on Cage Match, he, this would have been this is their fifth time that they've ever been in a match together. But most of them have been either trios or tag team matches, and none of them made tape. So this was probably this actually was the first time this thing that this singles match ever really happened. And I'm interested to hear how... The, so T-Hawk was actually getting over with the crowd as a yeah, heel. Yeah, he was definitely he was definitely over as a heel. Um, you know, uh, definitely someone that people didn't know super well, but, like, I think he immediately went into heel and, you know, saw that, you know, anyone who was going to, you know, beat up on Bandito was going to get a uh, pretty uh, strong reaction from the audience. So, yeah, I mean... T-Hawk didn't get a ton of shine this weekend outside of this match, uh, but I'll be curious to see if they bring him back, and I'll be curious to see, uh, you know, what sort of bookings he gets off of this, because, uh, you know, I I think, yeah, I like him a lot. I mean, I know he has kind of a weird reputation uh, with Dragon Gate, but, you know, kind of divorced from that for me. Yeah, I think... Uh, yeah, I could see him uh, taking off, uh, and I'd love to see him uh, work more. Now, you mentioned earlier, you know, why did uh, T-Hawk get this versus uh, some of the other guys, and what, what's your theory on that? Well, the, the there's several things working together with this. The first thing is with OWE, it really hasn't launched to the level that everyone was thinking when it first came out, like when it, when they first did the split and when they first really were showing that OWE were going to become a a large promotion and presence, that the idea was that they were going to have their own arena in Shanghai and run weekly events starting this summer. And they haven't had any they haven't had any shows. So most of T Hawk's work has been with Russell One or whenever Shima would go overseas. And he's he's been the one that goes overseas with Shima. And it's it's good for him because he's someone that really did need the breath of fresh air. And mm-hmm. he, I mean, the Dragon Gate audience just was not going to, was just never going to see him as a main event star. And it's kind of interesting since the, since the split, he's only had nine matches and four of them were for, four of them were for Russell one. He had the match last week against uh, Sobrano Jr. and Ray Horace and the crash and then two shows in, in Australia. So he's kind of been the one that Sheamus brought along, and I'm kind of surprised that El Lindeman has hasn't really been brought over to anything. But they just haven't done the touring outside of Japan, and the problem for the Chinese wrestlers, especially getting to the states, is the visa. Right. So, yeah. So like originally, OWE was going to have this link with of uh, future stars of wrestling in Las Vegas, and they were going to come over and do matches over there, and it just never happened because there was visa issues and the only Chinese wrestler from OWE who's been working in Japan is Gao Xingxia. And he was someone who had a visa through Dragon Gate and did a Dragon Gate appearance before, before the uh, split. So it's mm-hmm. just one of those, it's just one of those things that it, circumstances really haven't allowed for OWE to take off. And for someone like T-Hawk, he has now, they now currently have a home in Japan that he's been getting a night and day response to. And my, my kind of opinion of him coming into this weekend was if he really had the position to, to kind of take off and be able to get bookings on his own 
divorce from Shima, and it having two matches like that would be kind of tough for him, in my opinion. But I think, I mean, I think all the world at T-Hawk, he just was someone that was doomed by circumstances. Yeah, uh, this is probably a larger conversation, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, if OWE doesn't take off in uh, Shanghai, what do you see happening? Is it just going to be like a touring kind of like special events? Do they get folded back into the Dragon Gate fold or do you think they just kind of kind of quietly split and kind of like become indie guys? Well, to answer the the the, uh, the Dragon Gate question first, because that's the one that I think is more clear cut, it will be, it would take a lot for them to just immediately walk back into Dragon Gate. Mm-hmm. It was not, not a very pleasant split. And at least like language that I've heard and from people from Dragon Gate, especially from Shingo lately, has not been very positive towards Shima. So I don't know if they'll be marching in. I could see them kind of becoming more of an indie traveling stable. There are certainly enough promotions in their Wrestle One kind of level that could use a group like like Strong Hearts, just because like Shima by himself showing up to Russell one instantly boosted their box office in Tokyo. They went from, oh, wow. they went from doing very poorly in cork to actually getting a cork and that was getting a response, which is something that is pretty big. So I see them doing like a touring thing. And for someone like Shima, who now is 40, 20 years in the 20 years as a professional wrestler, I just, the end is coming a lot closer than, than I think people realize. So who knows what he does? He might just end up doing a bunch of those soul shows like the Nasawa show, like mm-hmm. the Tokyo Gurantai shows, where someone like T-Hawk and El Linda Man, they're, they're still in their mid-20s. So I could easily see them ending up in an, another promotion. I mean, the sad thing is with T-Hawk, I mean, as you've seen, for a guy uh, who's probably, he's listed as 5'10", he's probably about 5'8", really, but he's a sturdy-looking 5'8". He can mm-hmm. be put as... A, a junior in a lot of places and be a larger junior, but a Linda man, he's five foot two and that's yeah. being generous. So it'll be tough, tough for him. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I mean, there's just so much money behind OWE. Mm. There is just a ton of money there. So if it doesn't take off, I could see them really just still training these guys to do random things in China. I mean, yeah. there's the, the people behind it have a lot of different fields of, entertainment that they could go into so i mean that could happen it, 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 it's just it's interesting to see how that developed but getting back to the show the main event of the night had the last person from dragon gate or owe in it it was a ring comp of timothy thatcher and Walter defeating the debuting Ilya dragunov and the returning shingo takagi and at least from like the online response this seemed like this was the overall match of the night. Am I wrong in saying yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. Um, it was a fantastic tag, uh, uh, especially two uh, guys debuting who, like, were insanely over and, like, their charisma shined through. Uh, Ilya, uh, especially, you know, uh, you just, like, for someone who has never been seen in the States, he came out and just immediately he has such a frenetic energy to him that the audience was super uh, into. And I think that's also true with Shingo. Uh, you know, people were very excited to see this and, you know, they were the clear cut faces uh, against Ring Conf. Uh, yeah, this was, uh, you know, it was an interesting blend of styles where, uh, you know, they were clearly setting up, uh, Walter versus Shingo and, you know, being very smart on what spots they work together. Um, and then uh, after kind of the beginning, uh, a lot of it became Ilya being uh, face in peril, you know, a lot of the kind of that classic uh, tag team structure, but also, you know, the style of wrestling they were doing was, you know, just very aggressive, uh, hard hitting and, you know, uh yeah just brutal uh so it's like kind of interesting to see kind of that baby face in peril style which i always associate with like you know kind of a quicker uh you know lighter kind of wrestler being used uh with these four you know bruisers of the guys uh but yeah i mentioned earlier that you know these out of tournament matches are often about you know setting up the rest of the 
weakened in the tournament, and this was definitely the case, you know, Walter and Thatcher fighting on night two, and then uh, Ilya and Shingo fighting on night two, which was a uh, late uh, substitution. I forget what the original two people they were fighting were, but I think it had something to do with Chris Brooks's uh, injury, uh, which turned out, you know, to really work uh, for Shingo and Ilya as that match was the final tournament match of night two. But yeah, this tag match definitely got your way to see Shingo uh, fit in perfectly with these guys. And I think his style, you know, uh, will, you know, if he wants to do more American indies, you know, you're going to see him. uh, I think people are going to want to see him work this kind of match with, you know, I could see, you know, Walter and he or Thatcher and he, uh, you know, being one of those matches that a bunch of people try to book, you know, uh, or maybe we're just going to see Shingo against uh, Sammy Callahan across the country uh, as everyone uh, tries to book that match. Um, But yeah, Shingo was made this weekend in America. You know, I think you're going to see a ton of them. Yeah, and it's interesting for Shingo to have this matchup against Walter, Walter and Timothy Thatcher, seeing that their home is WXW. And Shingo what, spent some time in WXW in 2009. He won their tournament. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, 16 karat? Yeah, 16 karat gold. So I think that as, some, as he starts spreading out after October 7th, I think that him, and it seems like he really... He, like he posted photos of, with these three guys. It seems like that I think that we'll probably be seeing a whole lot of those four together going forward. And I mean, even with WXW, then you could probably from there see Shingo go, getting into progress and then other Euro Indies. And then, I mean, I'm not, I'm not always up on the state of Evolve, but Gabe is like Gabe loves Shingo. He used Shingo a whole lot. I mean, he had his excursion. Shingo's excursion was with Ring of Honor when Gabe booked it. So I could definitely see like as those as landing spots for him. And this is out of the matches from night one, this was the one that I was when they announced the card, I was most anticipating. To, if only because Walter versus Ilya Dragonoff was one of my favorite matches from last year. And mm-hmm. I was interested to see how Ilya's um, presence comes across to a different audience because it seems that for a lot of people who watch Ilya live, they aren't as that he has like a dichotomy of people who've seen him live and get his charisma versus people who watch on tape and are just like, oh, he's fine. I don't see the buzz for. So it's interesting, at least to me, to hear that in Los Angeles they got his his vibe, his shtick immediately. Yeah, it it was very uh, immediately over. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think also this is you know a good time for like those guys to make their uh, you know if not. American debut than re-debut, um, especially the type of wrestlers that have been kind of uh, eaten up by WWE, uh, you know, Riddle and Lee uh, and all those guys. I think there's definitely room on the indies right now for, you know, kind of hard-hitting uh, technical guys. Uh, so I think, you know, it's really uh, good timing for them. Right, and talking about this match kind of really segues into night two. I know that you only really caught the back half of night two, but the big match that I heard about from night two was the Takagi and uh, Dragunov match. How how did it come across live? Great, yeah. Uh, very, uh, yeah, I loved it. Um, yeah, uh, on night two, I was uh, coming down with a little bit of a bug, uh, but I wanted to go out of my way uh, to see this. Uh, and I don't remember exact details perfectly, but uh, yeah, uh, it was, you know, beating the hell out of each other. Um, there was a uh, Death Valley driver uh, on the apron. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think it was, oh, a lot of uh, gross at butts. Uh, maybe not... Uh, terribly uh gross you know uh, versus you know shibato okada but uh definitely some you heard it you know yeah. um it, but... especially with uh Ilya with his big move being the torpedo moscow head but you, you kind of have to prepare yourself that you're gonna be getting a lot of sickening thuds shingo's uh lariat is i think probably i don't know who's doing one that i like more right now it's 
so impressive and it, and it like even like big dudes like uh i mean we're talking about on night three but like walter you would be able to do the turned inside out bump from it but uh i don't know who do you like that has a better lariat than him i mean i i think the big thing of shingo is that for a guy of his size he understands what he has to do to make the lariat the pumping bomber into the move that it is so he gets so much momentum behind it and yeah. i think I think that adds a whole lot into it, and he's never been someone to not lay ne- lay hits in. Like he, like just going through like trying to get history, you will like see matches, and it's like, oh yeah, I know Shingo decided to beat the crap out of them, and he expected them to beat the crap out of them in return. And against someone like Ilya, it makes perfect sense that the two of them were just going all out, going all out, and especially like Shingo going against Walter. I mean, those are two of the guys, at least on this weekend, that you'd expect that they would not really. Uh, hold anything back against the, each other yeah uh and especially like uh throughout the tournament uh uh we talk about this more on night three but like there were definitely guys that like were being very protected like uh uh on night three walter made quick work of uh jonah rock uh you know Cobb made quick work of uh trevor lee and i think that just allowed people like shingo and bandito when they were having their matches with walter or you know Cobb, uh made them so much more impressive because you know they had such dominant uh second round victories over their opponents yeah uh shingo's size i mean i'm trying like what 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 is his size mike he's listed as a five nine and I've seen him live uh, enough, including those Orlando shows that you were talking about earlier, to kind of to question that a little bit. He he, for a guy of his size, he okay. So he's listed as five ten. He's not five ten. He's like five seven, mm-hmm. and two hundred and nine pounds. This is all from Cage Match. You know, I buy it. He's a thick guy. I mean, when you talk about the uh, meme of the manlet, he probably is like the the the, the, the biggest one you could think of. So. He, yeah, he's someone. I mean, he's he someone clearly, that, oh, go ahead. Oh, he clearly has a little bit of height on like Ishii, but like that is kind of what like I think of where it's like this kind of compactor guy, but like you never doubt that like oh yeah, this guy is like a fucking bruiser and mm-hmm. you know can beat the shit out of you even though you know it's a smaller guy. Like it's it's there's never that like disconnect that you sometimes get live when you're like. Oh, I don't know if I entirely buy this. It's uh, like, yeah, um, maybe Ishii is the more extreme version of that, uh, both in intensity and in uh, size. But uh, sure. I think kind of that's a similar thing. Right, yeah. And that's the interesting thing going forward with Shingo is a lot of people naturally go to, oh, is he going to jump to New Japan? And a lot of people think of him as a junior in, in New Japan. And he kind of, like, Ishii is the good comp because he kind of toes the line between a believable junior and a completely like of size heavyweight. So yeah, it, it'll be interesting for him. And it's one of those things that as he goes forward and, and especially like against Walter, who might realistically be six, three, six, four, like you can do the size disparity there. So it, it's interesting of Shingo because seeing him a lot in dragon gate, he always is one of the larger guys there, but now seeing him in a, venue that he's not that he's one of the smaller guys there i mean i mean at bola he's probably middle of the road but going forward if he does stuff in new japan which i don't think or more stuff in the united states and in europe he's going to either be in the middle of the road or towards the smaller size so it's interesting to me yeah but, yeah so the main event of night two was the other match that really had any dragon system people into it it was the Strong Hearts team of Shima and the Rascals, Desmond Xavier and Zachary Wentz going against Bandito, Fulmita, and Ray Horse. And Ray Horse is someone that I've always kind of found interesting because he's been a guy that's been around Tijuana for a long time. He is, I don't know if he's actually related to Ray Mysterio, but he has wrestled as like the son of Ray Mysterio or the son of Ray Mysterio too. Like he's he's run that character for a while. I believe he is related, but and so he's someone that has had a lot of interactions with Fulmita throughout his career. So mm-hmm. well, overall, this match was a lot shorter than one would expect, especially for a main event match of night two. I remember the one that we went, the one that I went to the main event night two was the crazy brawl that ended up being the last match of Super Dragon's career. So seeing one that went 
just under 12 minutes was kind of interesting. What did you think of the match overall? Oh, it was so much fun. I mean, yeah, it's definitely like short and compact, but like everyone got a bunch of shit in, you know, uh, I uh, didn't catch the all-in main event uh, live, uh, but when I saw it uh, the other week, it was somewhat similar to that, where it's like, oh, what all can we do in a 12-minute time frame? Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know... You know, they weren't, uh, you know, tagging in or anything like that. So, I mean, it was very just like, you know, spot, spot, spot. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I am referring to some of the uh, figure four notes uh, that are online. Uh, But, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, cool spots, a lot of cool dives. Uh, Bandito is doing uh, a very interesting spot that he did throughout the weekend. Um, it's hard to describe, um, but it's uh, like Xavier uh, and then later on uh, Janela or uh, did he do it as Shingo too? Maybe. But uh, it would be like almost like someone was set up for a 619 and then Bandito would do a handspring over someone's back like he was going to dive out of the ring. But then he would kind of like hit uh, like the back of the ropes like how... Uh, you know, Osprey or even Jay Lethal would for a cutter and then like roll back down and do a German. Yeah, uh, I, I saw a couple of gifts of it of yeah, him doing it, that before. It's crazy. It, it, insane. It's the most damnedest thing. Um yeah, uh you know, some of these dives, you know, there's the balcony uh at uh globe and I was at a vantage point uh, towards the entrance of the globe, which is under the uh, balcony. And they got so much air, I thought they were going to smack right into the balcony. Oh, jeez. Uh, but yeah, uh, Xavier and uh, Wentz, uh, um, this was not my first time seeing Xavier live, but it was my first time seeing Wentz live. And, you know, it's amazing how, like, you know, you miss like three or four PWG shows and now it's like a completely new roster. But uh yeah, uh, them and Shima, you know, uh, they work great together. Uh, you know, in Shima, you know, got in some good spots too. Uh, you know, but I mean, it does feel like, you know, the other five might have been doing uh, the more uh, shinier stuff, so to speak. Um, I would definitely want to rewatch this because, like, yeah, it's it, it, it is so fast paced, and uh, you know, I feel like there was so much shit in it. Um, that uh definitely yeah definitely like the like kind of fast-paced lucha uh showcase of the weekend i think uh even though the lucha guys throughout the weekend were doing impressive stuff and like really neat stuff and xavier and wentz's uh tag match on night three was also similarly bonkers but uh it feels like this was the one where they're like let's just go out in a sprint uh so if that's your style, uh, it certainly is for me. Uh, it's definitely worth watching. So night three was a lot of stuff on it. So do you want to talk about the uh, non-tournament matches first? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's always like a tag match and a Tin Man on night three. The Tin Man's uh, comedy. Uh, the only Dragon System guy in it was T-Hawk, and he did not do much. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a fun, you know, everyone gets their shit in, a lot of comedy match, so if that's your style, go for it. Uh, and then, uh, Rascals, uh, went over Lucha Bros, uh, and, uh, I guess, uh, Wentz and Xavier have done this gimmick before, but, uh, the story of the match was, like, they came out in the Lucha Brothers gear to piss them off, uh, and, uh, you know played, you know, shithead heels throughout the match. Uh, but, yeah, this, uh, you know, another short 11-minute match that I was just full of uh, really impressive work. Uh, definitely worth seeing. Uh, you know, I think PWG is clearly building the Rascals uh, as, like, the cornerstone of their tag division now that, you know, uh, I think you're not going to see as much of the Lucha Brothers maybe in PWG. I, maybe I'm wrong about that. And now that you or see, you know, the Bucks, you know, probably very sporadically. So the Rascals are definitely the guys of the tag division there. Um, so that's as far as non-tournament matches. Uh, then uh, tournament matches, uh, Shingo defeated Robbie Eagles. And this was, uh, yeah, a fun, short match. Uh, 
uh, kind of impressive how much uh, stuff uh, Shingo allowed uh, Eagles to get in and kind of the counterpoint to what we were talking about earlier with like Shingo's style and size, you know, it was kind of cool to see him work with like a smaller guy and still make that be like, oh, there were some times where it's believable that Eagles might have won. Uh, so that was, uh, I like that match. It was uh, one of the first matches of the night. Uh, then uh, we had uh, Janela defeating Shima. Uh, I thought this match was great. Uh, you know, it's very much, you know, in line with the Janela, you know, Japanese legends gimmick. But uh, I thought uh, it was really fun. Uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, definitely uh, the Shima singles effort to check out of the weekend. I think you're going to pick the two. Uh, but uh, yeah, I thought it was really great. Uh did Joey do anything really nuts towards him? Because I know he did against Bandito, and Shima's someone that doesn't usually go for a lot of plunder stuff. I didn't know. Did did Joey do any chair stuff or any like crazy dives like that? There might have been a crazy dive, uh, but I don't think there was any plunder in this. Uh, or if there was, uh, what happened in Bandito Janela, uh, you know, kind of overshot that um, <laughs> from in my head. I It's definitely... You know, so much wrestling over a week, and I that's definitely a match I want to go back to. Um, Bandito defeated Flamita, uh, and you know this was pretty uh, fun. And you know they went at each other pretty hard. I always like when you see tag partners uh, beat the shit out of each other. Uh, and you know at this point in night three, it's very clear like that Bandito was going to be one of the guys of the weekend. Uh, and then you had Bandito uh, against Joey Janela, uh, and that was uh, insane. Um, I think the big spot that, you know, people were talking about was, you know, Janela was calling for chairs, and, you know, people were tossing chairs in the ring, uh, you know, much to, I think, a lot of people's chagrin of not wanting to have chairs thrown at them. Uh, so uh, the respectful fans were uh, just handing them into the ring. Uh, but uh, that accumulated in... Uh, Bandito doing his uh, flipping power slam off the top rope onto a pyramid of chairs onto Joey. Uh, and uh, I believe Joey had a broken foot this week. I mean, I don't know what the exact diagnosis was, but after Friday, he tweeted something about maybe having a broken foot. I don't know if that was him working or just having an injury. But uh, this match, knowing that after the fact, uh, makes Janela's work uh, this weekend, especially in this match, just more impressive uh, and more uh, really worth seeking out that uh, match. Uh, I think the next uh, Dragon System match was Shingo versus Walter, uh, and it was Shingo pinning uh, Walter, the champ, uh, which, you know, I'd imagine sets, you know, Shingo up for a uh, title match at some point um, if they choose to do that. Um, but yeah, the story of this was pretty much, you know, Walter uh, beating the shit out of Shingo, trying to get on his like choke, a uh, lot of chops, a lot of real hard hitting shit for Shingo. And then Shingo kind of pulling it out at the back half of, you know, just like getting in his shit, you know, really impressive lariat to uh, Walter hitting that pump handle uh, and was definitely like a thing where it's like the crowd wanted it. I mean, Walter is so good at, I mean, I guess technically he's face, but, you know, he plays such a bullying asshole. This weekend, he was definitely a heel. So, like, the crowd was really wanting to see Shingo win, and uh, that's what uh, they got. Um, so I expect to see this match again in PWG, or if not uh, elsewhere, uh, which I think leads us to the finals. Uh, yeah, yeah. But before we get to that, the one thing that I thought was really interesting, just looking at the results here, was with Shingo and Walter. That's a match that never happened in WXW. Like there was a tag match on like a Dragon Gate Produce show with WXW. Mm -hmm. So the the fact that when they booked this tournament and they already felt like they had Shingo coming, if they didn't think they had Shingo coming back, that looking back through the bracket, you see these matches like Joey Janela versus Shima. Like, as you said, I didn't put two and two together just then until then about Joey Janela wanting to face all these nineties to early two thousands Japanese stars. And that's just such a smart idea. And then Bandito and Flamita, they've 
really been kind of tied to the hip over the last year, but you haven't really seen a whole lot of the two of them against each other. So just like seeing how, like how, how they've decided to set up this tournament that way, I thought was really impressive. Yeah, they do a really good job of like, oftentimes, you know, sometimes it's giving you exactly what you want to see. And then there's like, you know, I, I always go back to 2015 when like, uh, I think on night three, they uh, booked uh, Zack Sabre Jr. versus Pentagon, which, you know, for two guys who had so much heat, I don't think anyone was like, oh, we need to see Zack Sabre versus uh, Pentagon. But it's like when it happened, it was like, oh, shit, this is something that I would never expect to see anywhere. Um, so but yeah, the main event. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, you know, uh, if you're not familiar with the Bola style of main event, uh, uh, it's a uh, triangle match, elimination style. Um, in past years, um, they've it's been a fairly short match. This was definitely one of the longer uh, finals. It's definitely, I think, I mean, I can't think of a final match that I liked more. Um, and it was Jeff Cobb, Bandito, and Shingo. Um, Shingo was the first eliminated by Bandito. Uh, you got a lot of Bandito versus uh, Shingo in this first uh, half, uh, and they were definitely setting, you know, the story I, I certainly bought into it was, you know, is Bandito going to do it? Uh, you know, he gave Shingo that, you know, impressive, uh, you know, uh, flipping uh, uh, power slam, uh, you know, and then the back half, which was maybe 10 or 15 minutes of just Cobb against Bandito, then throwing everything they had at each other. Uh, you know, both people probably twice at it where it's like, well, that's it. You know, that's the match, uh, you know, and then, you know, kicking out and then being like, oh, damn, I guess this is going to go on longer. Uh, and uh, Cobb doing uh, Bandito in uh, with a uh, tour of the islands uh, that I think he hit twice. Uh, you know, I haven't talked much about Cobb this weekend. He was, uh, you know, definitely super favorite with the audience. You know, if it wasn't going to be Bandito, uh, I would say probably Cobb or Janela was who the audience wanted. Uh, and, you know, he's, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, impressive guy. And it has certainly been a fixture of PWG for a while. So it makes a lot of sense. You know, I think there were people and, you know, it was Bandito's uh, first Bola, uh, and you know they often like to you know have someone lose once to kind of build them up over a longer period of time. Uh, but yeah, this final was great. This whole night three um, was you know as good of a night three as I've seen them do. Uh, you know, everyone shined. Uh, the Dragon System guys, you know, yeah. I mean, I think you're going to see so much more of Shingo in America. I think you're going to see a ton of. Ban I mean, wherever Bandito wants to go, I think you're going to see him a ton. Uh, I hope to see more Shima in America. That would be super cool. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, even if you're not a huge uh, PWG guy uh, or gal or you know person, you know, I would say checking out this bola is worthwhile. You know, I think. Uh, you know, the style uh, always evolves, you know, in PWG, you know, just depending on who they, you know, who's just come through or, you know, who they have. Um, but I think that this is uh, as good of a bowl as any other. It's uh, pretty, you know, an easy watch, I bet, on tape. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would say keep an eye on it uh, when it drops. Yeah, I mean, as soon as I put the pre-order up, I knew I was... I, I have High Spots Network, but knowing that was going to be 12 months for that, and I really hate buying DVDs nowadays or Blu-rays. Totally. It's such a beating, but knowing like the matchups that came out of this and the only way I'd be able to see it would be either waiting a year or I don't even know if they still do the direct downloads for PWG shows. They, don't. They, uh, they only do, uh, they put it on High Spots uh, after the fact. Yeah, and it's about it, it's about a year a year delay on that. So especially for me as someone that I even with the indies and the rest of wrestling world, which I'm not as up on this year as I've been in the past, seeing all these guys together, and then again the really smart booking of matches that you didn't expect to see, or the matches that you always in the back of your mind it's like, oh, that would have been a dream match. I would have loved to see what would happen with that, and it, it, it's really interesting. I think that Shingo has already been talking about coming back in October and I'll be sure to, tr to track his progress throughout the wrestling world on the show. So it'll be interesting to see like that. And then Bandito and Flamita kind of made their 
decision on what side they were going to go to with the split and they're coming back to dragon gate for november and december so it's interesting now uh i'd be remiss before lenny good ask you did you notice any interaction whatsoever between shingo and shima and t hawk at all uh no there was none whatsoever um they <laughs> That's weren't any matches together uh they weren't uh i mean unless they I mean, you know, I was looking for Strongheart's gear, and maybe I wasn't there early enough for it, because I did see some people in it, mm-hmm. but, like, I mean, I also didn't see uh, them selling shit, so there was no Shingo or Shima interaction, no, no T-Hawk, Shingo interaction uh, whatsoever. Yeah, I, I was kind of joking around, when, like, when they set up these cards, saying, come on, book Shima versus Shingo, you have to do it, and then the whole press conference coming out where... Shingo very openly says how much he's not going to go to Shanghai and you'll mm-hmm. never see him there. And then kind of looking more into it in that Shima and Shingo have some pretty heavy heat. I was like, I wonder if they talked at all this weekend. I wonder if they just kind of sat on the opposite ends of the locker room and just kind of nodded at each other and went about their business. I mean, I know some of the dudes went to Muscle Beach, uh, which is always yeah. what uh, international dudes do when they're in Los Angeles. Is uh, Muscle Beach is this outdoor beach uh, uh, gym uh, in Venice uh, that's kind of like known for like the where Schwarzenegger and all of them worked out in the seventies and eighties. It's uh, mm-hmm. a shitty gym. Uh, it's a gross place, uh, but you know it does hold this like kind of like historical significance for guys um maybe you might be able to see if they were together at that um uh, shingo definitely went both there into the original gold's gym he posted all about it on instagram God, it's yeah. it's photos of him at gold's gym uh hanging out with the wxw guys and starbucks like that's all his instagram was and shima wasn't as much either so i don't know if they actually saw each other that's something that i'm kind of wondering right now yeah. if they did or didn't so i guess not uh nope i guess not uh. <laughs> and i think that's going to continue going on into the future mm-hmm. but but yeah uh before i let you thank you so much for coming on brother i appreciate it uh, do you have anything that you want to plug away before i let you go uh you know um follow me on twitter if you like uh me uh just drew spurs like what goes on food um and i usually post uh i perform comedy in los angeles uh and i usually post my dates there so uh feel free to check me out there um that's about it uh mike thank you so much for having me yeah thanks so much drew have to come on some other time in the future yeah i'd love to Dangerous Gate was held on September 24th from Tokyo Oda City General Gymnasium. The uh, listed attendance was 3177. It was called a super no vacancy full house. Looked like there were some scattered seats. On the last episode, Case and I talked about what we were expecting for attendance, and I thought it was going to be around 3400, 3500, and I think Case believe the same but if this is what oda city gymnasium holds for dragon gate and it was listed as virtually a sellout then you know it it's strong for dragon gate then i mean it kind of puts the shows that they said they were doing 4800 and 5000 in perspective and what sort of kayfabe uh, a kayfabe inflation they had but it makes me wonder if you were really going to use their big ace up of their sleeve in this uh, Yoshino Doi match if for only 3,100 people versus larger venues, either being Osaka, Edeon 1, or Fukuoka. If, it, if those matches would have been, or those venues would have been the better place for this match. Overall, I thought this was the most consistent big show that Dragon Gate has had in 2018. There really wasn't anything that was outright bad on the show. There's probably only one match I would say skip. But it was, I, I came away really positive from the show. It didn't have the highs like Kobe World's Twin Gate match between Yamato and Hulk versus Big Ben or the Triangle Gate match from uh, Dead or Alive. But all in all, it was a pretty easy watch and there was enough very very good on this show to verging on great in some in some places that it's worth going out of your way to watch
The opener was Ryo Saito, Don Fuji, Willie Mack versus the Tribe Vanguard team of Kagatora, Yosuke Santa Maria, and UT. Willie Mack got the win in his last match of this tour in 9 minutes and 55 seconds with his big thump splash on Maria. And I thought this was a really strong opener. The uh, It really was another showcase for Willie Mack, and he really was going at it pretty hard and fierce, and Tri Vanguard made him look really good in that. The uh, team and chemistry between the Bicycle Bros and uh, Willie Mack is pretty... It was pretty astonishing for someone who's only been in Dragon Gate for two months, but this has been such a great tour for him, and especially as a first tour for him and how he's adapted to Dragon Gate style and how the crowd knows his stuff it, it it's really encouraging i definitely would like to see him back again and it was a fun sprint i had it at three stars which might have been one of the higher openers that i've had in dragon gate in a while so it's definitely worth seeking out especially if you're trying to get a complete look of willie mack this uh this tour and again the as i've said on previous shows this tri vanguard trio of ut kagator maria's are uh, is really great and i hope that somehow they're going to be marched they're going to be locked into another Triangle Gate Challenge, and I could see them as a Triangle Gate Champion team at this time. The uh, second match was an eight-person kind of the mixed, the, the mixed match that you see very low on these big shows. It had Jason Lee, Kaido Ishida, Hio Watanabe, Yuki Yoshioka versus Gamma, Sachihoko Boy, Prob- uh, Mondai Ryu, Problem Dragon, and Kota Minanura, and... Ishida got the win in 6 minutes and 22 seconds with the Tiger Suplex hold on Sachi Hoko Boy. And this wasn't that great of a match, to be honest. This was by far the worst match on the show. Both uh, Yoshioka and Minonora had off days, and they weren't looking that solid in the match. And it just was really rushed. With a 6-minute match, I don't remember Gamma really taking a bump at all. And... You just had uh, just like flashes of Jason Lee. You had a pretty fun little strike combination between Ishida and Gamma, but that really was it. And it's it, if you're looking to cut a match out of the show, just skip this one. It just was your your typical get everyone on the card. The third match was the beginning of Shingo Takagi's farewell tour in Dragon Gate. It was a singles match with Kai and. It was built up in the pre-match video with both of them being graduates of the Animal Hamaguchi School. So that's kind of at least the reason why this match happened. And it was Kai's best match in Dragon Gate. I went three and a half on this. And uh, it really does seem that unless you can work Kai's specific style, it, it just doesn't work. He's not able to adapt to a Dragon Gate Lucharesu style, whereas Shingo Takaki can pretty much do anything in that made this a pretty solid match and the i didn't mention the finish earlier it was uh kai penning shingo kind of surprisingly in 12 minutes and 16 seconds with the ganosuke clutch and the the crowd was was a lot more for shingo than he than pretty much anything since before monster express it could either be that they anticipate that fondness is going to make the heart warmer for him and uh it, it it was a it, again this was this was a very good match had a great closing splash a closing stretch with the two of them basically like just throwing bombs and going for cradles until Kai got the Ganosuke clutch. The fourth match was the Natural Vibes versus Antios All Out War Elimination match where before the match started they debuted that that. Antios has now changed to red, which stands for Real Extreme Diffusion, and the cr- I guess this is the best time to get into this about red. They just it this unit was dead on arrival. Uh, the, the crowd was either dead silent for for like Ada's promo before the match, and just really couldn't give a just couldn't care either way about it, and they. The, the the other big surprise of the of X being Cosmos Sakamoto was met with utter silence. The crowd either didn't know who he, who he was or just was so deflated by seeing him that they just sat on their hands during that. And he's Cosma 
doesn't really fit into Dragon Gate at all. I, I don't know who fits in less, him or Kai, and it's really not encouraging that with uh, with Strong Hearts and Shima now popping up everywhere, this the show happened less than 24 hours after Strong Hearts made their debut in DDT, that Dragon Gate's going for Wrestle 1 cast-offs. It's not... The, the, the crowd just... The, it's not a good portent for the company's future or at least being able to read what the crowd wants when you, you build that someone's going to be this big mysterious ex and it's a guy that your crowd either hasn't heard of or just thinks he stinks and just don't want to show any display of hatred towards but that all being said red won this match it from five five eliminations to three in 23 minutes and 49 seconds. Going through the eliminations real quick, Horikuchi got the first elimination of Takashi Yoshida in 11 minutes and 12 seconds with a backslide from heaven. That was very quickly followed up by a series of eliminations. Shimizu eliminated both Brother Yashi and Genki Horikuchi, the first at 12.24 and the second at 12.39 with the shot put slam on both. KZ got a running elbow smash elimination of Kanda at 13.41. The one um, over the top rope elimination happened at 13.48 with Tomonaga managing to trick Shimizu into falling out of the ring. And then Kazuma got his only elimination in 15 minutes and 51 seconds on Tomonaga. And then the final two eliminations were both from Benke as he speared Susumu at 1943 and gave KZ a Benke bomb at 2349. And this was a match that really was, it, it, it really was separated into parts. The opening part of it really wasn't much. It was kind of slow it just was just a back and forth that really up until about the eight minute mark not a whole lot was going on and it was kind of uh it, it was really lack of luster in comparison to the other elimination matches that dragon gate has had but as soon as things picked up first with uh ginky horiguchi doing the uh, backslide from heaven very early kind of letting the crowd know oh, we're getting into an elimination stretch because then there were, in a period of less than three minutes, there were five eliminations, and they all came pretty fast and heavy, especially with uh, Shimizu doing the uh, the shot put slam on both Horiguchi and Yashi in short order, that that was a good way of kind of setting Shimizu up to look strong, especially considering that he was going to get eliminated like a dipshit that he is, and... The only thing that was really kind of a negative of that was you could tell that KZ was trying to do the fake, uh, the the fake elimination save where someone like, where someone holds you back right as the three count happens and then you get let go, you dive to try to break it up and I don't know who on red was supposed to be preventing that but it just it didn't look so great and then the, and and then the final stretch when it was down to two on two between. Ben K and Kazma versus Susumu, Yokosuka, and KZ was actually really great. That that, that uh, finishing stretch saved this from being a very mediocre elimination match. And really, Ben K looked like an absolute monster in it. He's easily the person in red at this moment who most looks like a dominating heel. The, the, he's kept the uh, short tights look, and he has the contacts, and it gives him kind of a Terminator vibe, which really fits well... I feel like it fits his character a lot more than the quiet, br the, the quiet like muscle man and mon and maximum, and the gear looks a lot better too. And the moments with Susumu and Benke were really great. You can tell that these two already have a bunch of chemistry with each other. And the only thing that I could really say detracted from this finishing stretch of basically Shimizu and not Shimizu, pardon me, Susumu and KZ just fighting for their lives against a man monster was Kazmo was just there. He did he he did do a, a top rope power bomb through a table on KZ that was pretty that that looked pretty good. But other than that, he didn't contribute much to this match at all. It really was the uh, Bing K show for the rest of it. But really, the, this last 
five minutes, pretty m- or this last eight minutes, as soon as uh, Tominaga gets eliminated, and it's two on two, is really worth watching. The, the The first eight minutes weren't so great. The the, the stretch of eliminations were pretty good, other than the really noticeable KZ trying to act like he was going to make the save but couldn't. That uh, it was a uh, pretty solid. I went this, I went three and three quarters, really just saved by how great the final stretch was with Ben K, and it makes sense going on what happened after the Dreamgate match. After that, there were the three title matches on the show. The first one was the open the the Brave Gate championship match between Dragon Kid and Ata. Dragon Kid got back his title in 13 minutes with the Ultra Hurricane Rana, and he becomes the 36th Brave Gate champion. And a lot like the, the the elimination match, this was a match of this was a match of like distinct segments into it. The first three or four minutes was a really fast brawling pace where the where we kind of got to see the best of Ada and DK technically, and then it went into a just a plunder part with Ada just attacking him with chairs, getting a very close count out. And then leading into the final stretch with Ada's barbed wire board. And the plunder stuff was all right. The, the barbed wire board was by far the best part of it. Where, where, where Dragon Kid reversed Ada in, with a uh, head scissors through the barbed wire board. And there, there was a really uh, cool moment where with all the cheating, Yagi just doesn't have it, had enough of it. And attacked uh, Ada with a really stiff looking clothesline. And... This was, in my opinion, the best of the Ada and DK feud. And even saying that, I only had this match at three and a quarter. It just, these two, considering how long their feud and the storyline's been, the, their chemistry isn't where it should be, especially for someone like Dragon Kid, who has had really strong storied rivalries. This one just misses the mark, and they had to get the title off of Ada. I mean, if he's going to lead Red... You don't want your your heel unit leader to be just your secondary champion. It makes the unit look even more weak than it already is. So it looks like that it's time for Ada to move on. He's not figuring into the Dreamgate picture yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if the after the challenge at Gate Destiny, if it doesn't, if Yoshino retains, that Ada might be someone at a at another title match. I don't think he's a final gate challenger i think like you you might as well go with either kz or susumu there if that's the case but it just it, it ate a need to drop the brave gate it just wasn't working for him and dragon kid is a known quantity here and might as well have him hold it before someone else takes it hopefully some of the younger generation the semi-main event was the open the twin gate championship match with yamato and bb hulk versus the um, mochizuki dojo team of masaki mochizuki and shun skywalker Yama Hulk got the defense in 21 minutes and 32 seconds with Hulk pinning Skywalker with the fi- with the first flash and it's the second defense for the team and I had this match at four and a quarter. It really it it's really remarkable how this tag team has really revitalized Hulk's career. He's someone that looked like he was on last legs before Kobe World and he's put together a surprisingly strong fall. And this was a this was a tremendous match. The big story from uh, about it was Yamato being a huge bully to both Mochizuki and Shun, and especially Shun, and having Shun play a really strong face in peril for a match that was 21 minutes long. About 10 minutes of it solidly was Shun getting his ass kicked, and he did a great job in that role, and kind of had him towards the end trying to rise up and summon whatever energy and wits he had left to try to attack both Hulk and Yamato until he basically got murdered <laughs> in the in the end. He took a Galleria, he took a couple f- first flashes, and he took the uh, final, f- the, the, the first flash Galleria combination that Mochizuki was able to get a, sh- to get a save on, and Shun looked pretty solid here after, he, after some really shaky moments. This was the third straight show that he had a dive that he almost died on. And it was a just a springboard splash to the outside where he was really short on it. And it was really noticeable how short he was. And Yamato and Hulk had to save him on that. 
there w- there really wasn't as much Mochizuki in this match that I expected. It really was Yamato and a Hulk focusing on Shun. There was a pretty great elbow battle between Yamato and Shun towards the end, and the crowd was getting into it, and it seems like they're getting behind Shun, and they kind of know what kind of role he is. And that really plays into the post-match where Mochizuki tried to get Shun to shake both uh, Yamato and Hulk's hand, but he was so frustrated and despondent from the loss that he just shoved them away and walked out. And it's really good for Shun's character to be good portrayed by this, that he's someone that we, we know where he is on the card. We know where he is in comparison to Binkei and the rest of the people of his class, but he's so frustrated by not being able to win the belt and be able to basically prove his worth that he just can't he he can't take the uh, appreciation and the respect of his of older wrestlers so he just like shoves shoves them down and goes to the back by himself and it's a nice little character trait for someone who up until then didn't have a lot of character or at least a lot of things going on for him so we're already seeing how this mochizuki dojo storyline is is paying off and i think it's great for him and i hope that we get a little bit more character from both Hyo and Yuki Yoshioka going forward. But this uh, Mochizuki Dojo team and storyline has already been pretty great. And this match, again, four and a quarter. I don't have it as as high as the Big Ben and the Big Ben title match at at Kobe World just because there was enough little like shakiness out of Shun. And I would like to see a little bit more Mochizuki in that match, but definitely worth going out of your way to see. The main event of uh, Dangerous Gate was the Open the Dream Gate match between Maximum Teammates and Tag Team Partners as Masayo Yoshino defended the title against Naruki Doi, Mr. Oda, as they made a big deal of before the match. And Yoshino gets his third Dream Key in 28 minutes and 50 seconds with the the Hore's Sol Naciente Kai variant. And this was... uh, I feel like it's one of the better matches that Doi and Yoshino have had. It's kind of it's kind of interesting to me that they've had like this tremendous just back and forth rivalry throughout their career and it's difficult for me to remember a lot of the matches and how remarkable they are or not as remarkable as they are. But this one was a solid one. I would probably put it on the same level as the Twin Gate match. I don't know which one I would immediately call the match of the night, but It was four and a quarter stars. It had kind of a slow opening, which really for the Dreamgate matches is getting kind of tiresome for me between how Yoshino's really doing these openings and how Yamato did these openings as well. And it makes me kind of miss how Misaki Mochizuki's recent title reign had a whole lot of different things with it. But that it it played into later in the matches. Both Both the guys were going for each other's arm obviously for doi he's trying to prevent the soul naciente and for yoshino he's trying to weaken the arm so he can put the soul naciente on in a more effective manner and there are a couple of moments in this match that were pretty unique before the match there was the big thing about how naruki doi was talking about how since he's mr oda city that he was going to find a way to put Yoshino out with a new finishing move. And we didn't really see anything of it, but he really teased the muscular bomb in more ways than he has in the last few years. I counted at least three attempts. And the last one was actually really neat because Yoshino struggled out of it and was trying to crawl through. But then then Doi put the uh, Sol Naciente on himself and it, it was a really long Sol Naciente attempt. And it, for the crowd and the audi- the crowd and Oda, they were biting and they thought that this could be the title change. I've talked to other people like Case who watched this match unspoiled that bought that as the possible finish, and that was really, really neat. The other side of this was there were so many attempts of both the uh, muscular bomb and Yoshino went for the top rope lightning spiral, and I can't remember the last time he hit the top rope lightning spiral, so I don't even know why he bothered for that. He just kind of Those were the little things that took this away from this match being one of those incredibly high top tier Dreamgate matches, but still was a incredible match. There was a there was a dive where Yoshino went for a Tope Sudasita, where 
where Yoshino went for the Tope Suicida, and Doi barely caught him, and he almost compl- Yoshino almost completely overflew him and was almost hit the ramp, and that was really kind of incredible. And this, again, was Yoshino's best match by far of this title reign. I mean, in comparison to the Shingo Takagi match that the finish kind of came out of nowhere and how terrible the Yoshida match was, this was a very good match that is kind of the match that you want to pad out your Dreamgate title reign with, that you want to have like these matches and a couple matches that were a little bit higher that. Like, just looking at Mochizuki's last reign, this probably would have been the weakest match of Mochizuki's reign because Mochizuki had so many, so many high-level Dreamgate matches. But for Yoshino, this is the best one so far. And really, it seems like, to me at least personally, we've reached the end of this reign, especially with the post-match where Red came down and attacked both of them and Ada nominated Binkei as the next Dreamgate challenger and that looks like that's going to that has been signed and will be happening at Gate of Destiny in November. So we're, we're at this place where with Yoshino where there just aren't as many top line Dreamgate matches for him left. I mean, Shingo Takagi will be gone, but he's already had that match. You probably wouldn't have another Mochizuki challenge until far down the line. I guess Susumu. But Susumu's kind of had his title matches, had his, his short reign is back down in the picture, and I don't know why you would go for Susumu when you still like KZ there. So to me personally, it looks like that this title reign is reaching to a point where they, where, where Yoshino served his purpose. He stabilized the company after the split, and they really have to find out who out of these young guys can really carry the company into the future and. With, with how he's been wrestling right now and how he's been and how he's portrayed in his unit, Bing K is the right person. And he's not getting any younger. He's already had his he's already had a very good Dreamgate challenge earlier this year. And for Red's sake, they need someone to make the unit some sort of a factor and not just have them be this useless heel unit that's just Berserk version three and uh, and it makes this upcoming Gate of Destiny match really important, at, at least for the near future of what's going to happen in Dragon Gate. But going back to Dangerous Gate, again, this so far is my big show of the year. It's nothing blow away, but really, when you have a show that only one match out of seven is below three stars, and you have two four-star matches, you have to recommend the show as going out of your way to watch, and that's how I felt about it. Closing out this edition of Open the Voice Gate, I'm going to take a look at the two early October cards that will be on Dragon Gate Network. They will both air by the time of our next show. Case will be joining me and we'll be doing a deep dive into the Dragon Gate career of Shingo Takagi. But before that, we have a show on October 2nd and a show on October 7th. The second one's from Cork and Hall. And it has Shingo Takagi's final Dragon Gate match in Tokyo as the main event. The opener is the Natural Vibes team of KZ, Susumu Yokosuka, Brother Yashi versus Mondai Ryu slash Problem Dragon, Kota Minenora, and Hiroshi Yamato. It's interesting that KZ is doing openers both on this and on October 7th. I... This is the first time I really remember him being down in the opener since Natural Vibes form, so that's kind of interesting. Hopefully Minanura has a bounce back from a disappointing match at Dangerous Gate, and uh, with Hiroshi Yamato, at least we'll get the charming entrance. Match 2 has the Bicycle Brothers team of Ryo Saito and Don Fuji facing Ginky Horiguchi and Gamma. Uh, I like the uh, Bicycle Brothers team. I like they've stuck together as there's not very many permanent tag teams in Dragon Gate right now. So I'm glad that they're going to be on both these cards and they're going to be tag teaming together. The Ginky and Gamma tag team, I mean, it's there. Uh, match three is uh, Pone Trumanaga versus Kai. And Wolf, uh, as I said earlier, I don't think... Kai works in Dragon Gate. I've said this now several times across several episodes, and I don't think Punch Shomanaga is going to rustle his side, his style. So this isn't going to be very good. Match four, however, looks really exciting to me. It is a uh, 
Tri Vanguard versus Mochizuki Dojo eight person tag team match with Yamato, Kagatora, Yosuke San Maria, and UT against the full complement of Mochizuki Dojo. So that's Mochizuki, Shun Skywalker, Hio Watanabe, and Yuki Yoshioka. As it, I really love this uh, trio of Kakatora, Maria, and UT. It's cool that Yamato is going to team with them for the night, and we really haven't seen the full complement of Mochizuki Dojo together. So I'm psyched to see how they are, and they're in a they're in a higher spot than usual on the card. Maybe the uh, whole maximum imitation maximum situation would be settled by the end of the night because match five is. Jason Lee, Dragon Kid, and Kaido Ishida against the red team of Takashi Yoshida, Yuzushi Kanda, and Kazuma Sakamoto. And that might be my least favorite possible combination of red partners. So that's I'm not too excited about that side. But I've, they really need to figure out where they're going with this maximum Dragon Kid Ishida storyline. Really, they now both have Maximum gear, and Maximum's down at three members, so they might as well either fully blow them off now, which would be hilarious, because they spent all that time making gear, and now they're cast out to the waste, or just have them join up. I mean, Maximum has three members now, they desperately need someone, and to be honest, the two, the two kind of work with the other three, so why not? The uh, sixth match is a match that was built up in the September Cork, and it is Speed Muscle, Doi Yoshi, Naruki Doi, Masato Yoshino against Big Ben, Big R Shimizu, and Ben K. This is a match I've been excited for since it was announced. I think that this is a good opportunity for Ben K to get a preliminary win on Yoshino leading up to Gated Destiny. So this match is uh, uh, it's probably going to be my match of the night just because I think in the main event, which is the Shingo Takagi final Dragon Gate match in Tokyo, where he's teaming for the first time in over 10 years with BB Hulk against Ada and X. I I think that they're kind of telegraphing something here. I First off, X, who knows who's going to be at this point. I was fairly confident that Kondo was going to join them at Dangerous Gate, and that didn't happen. So, I mean, it could literally be anyone. I mean, it could... Somehow, Willie Mack could be staying around and, and making a sudden heel turn. I don't think that, I mean, I don't think it's going to happen, but it could. I mean, it could be Kenichiro Horai if they're going to keep on having Russell 1 people show up now and actually be okay with Kenichiro Horai back in Dragon Gate personally. So if that happens, I'll be okay with it. But this really kind of feels like a match for uh, Red to kind of interfere and make into a larger match. I mean, Really, with Masato Yoshino and Ruki Doi not being involved, I feel like that somehow they're going to get kind of shoved in. Wouldn't be surprised if Yamato gets shoved in, and then we have like a larger five, uh, sorry, ten person tag or eight person tag happening out of that. October seventh is the show out of Hakata Star Lanes. The main event is Shingo Takagi's Dragon Gate Final, where he faces off against BB Hulk, and I'm just going to touch on that one first. Up. Uh, I'm incredibly excited about this. It would have been incredibly disappointing if they, if Shino Takagi was going to leave Dragon Gate and they didn't tie up this loose end with BB Hulk. He is his biggest generational rival. He is, I mean, for the last 10 years in a lot of ways, the story of Dragon Gate has been Shino Takagi versus, versus BB Hulk. So after a decade, I'm kind of glad that this is going to happen. And I'm excited to see it. This is the same place that Shingo Takagi debuted in, only... Fifth, only 14 years ago, so it's nice that th th this is a nice way to kind of send them off. The rest of the card has that Natural Vibes opening team of KZ, Susumu Yokosuka, and Brother Yashi versus Jason Lee, Problem Dragon slash Mondai Ryu, and Hio Watanabe. And again, it's interesting that this is that they have this team running twice in a row. I mean, that the uh, other team, I mean, it's a mixed team who really knows from there. Uh, it, it looks like a pretty standard opener. Match two is Ryo Saito and Don Fuji versus Gamma and Sachi Hoko Boy. So it's interesting that Sachi Hoko Boy is kind of showing up on TV. He usually gets pulled out of mothballs lately for the big show. So it's nice that he's going to be here. And I think it's interesting that Gamma has two straight matches against the Bicycle Brothers. This has kind of been forgotten, but after... Uh, dead or alive there was talks of like a proto unit or like an team up of D 
Doi, uh, not Doi, sorry, Ryo Saito, Don Fuji, and Kness before Kness got injured. But after Kness got injured, it just kind of became Bicycle Brothers. So maybe, maybe Gamma ends up with those two. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it gives him something to do, really. And uh, if, they're, if this is going to become the fifth unit, it gives kind of a formation point for them. Match three, Takashi Yoshida versus Punch Tomonaga. This match has to have happened at least a dozen times over the last few years, so really not much to say about that. Match four is uh, Tri Vanguard versus uh, Mochizuki Dojo, and it's pretty neat that there's two Tri Vanguard versus Mochizuki Dojo matches happening within a week. The uh, Tri Vanguard team is Yamato, Yosuke Samaria, and UT going up against. Masaki Mochizuki, Shun Skywalker, and Yuki Yoshioka. This is the highest that Yoshioka has really been on a card in a while, so it's a good opportunity for him to kind of show what he's got, and especially against uh, the uh, Tri Vanguard team that's looking stronger and stronger as we go along in this year. The semi main event is an eight person tag match with uh, Maximum and Imitation Maximum. With If they don't settle this whole Dragon Kid Kaido Ishida mess, at Cork, and they they really should sell it here. Like this is they, they they've got to tie this up, and if they're not joining Maximum, they got to find out where else they're going to go. But that team is Dragon Kid and Shida teaming with Speed Muscle, Naruki Doi, and Masato Yoshino against a red, which is kind of the top red team. Looking at it, it's Big R Shimizu, Benkei, Ada, and Yuzushi Kanda, and. This is another opportunity for like a preliminary clash between Yoshino and Binke. So I'm excited about that. And it, it, it this probably has, if it's not for the main event, it probably has opportunity for being the show stealer. It's also great seeing Ishida in semi-main events. So, and then, so it'll be interesting to see. And then the main event, as I mentioned earlier, is Shingo Takagi Dragon Gate Final, where he faces off against BB Hulk. So those are two pretty big cards to lead off October, and again, uh, we'll be back with Open the Voice Gate after that, talking about those, and a really deep dive into the career of Shingo Takagi and Dragon Gate. But that's it for this episode of Open the Voice Gate. I'd like to thank you all for listening. I also would like to thank Drew for joining me and talking about Bola. You could follow Drew on Twitter, at Drew Spurs, that's D-R-E-W-S-P-U-R-S. And while you're at it, please follow us on Twitter at Open the Voice Gate. And, and while you're already looking around the internet, please rate and subscribe to us on the podcast platform of your choosing. We're on iTunes, we're on Google Podcasts, we're on Stitcher.